So last week I talked about the Lotus 88 and how that was all controversial and banned before it really got running. And also in that video I gave a brief explanation as to what ground effect is and how it all works, as well as mentioning that the history of how it came to be in F1 was a story in itself. Because like I said in the Lotus 88 and Lotus 56 videos, experimental cars aren't really a thing anymore. Probably because, well, money. It's a lot of money to throw at a project that might not work, with Nismo and the GTR LM serving as a pretty recent warning from history. But when it comes to ground effect cars in Formula 1, Colin Chapman is the guy, as he is often the guy for a lot of other things pioneered in the sport, even if others might have already done the early experimentation. And this is the same case here, as the earliest example of a car using various factors that make up a ground effect car go back to the early 1960s, long before Chappers started whacking his wings onto Lotus 49s. While others might have attempted it first, Chapman was the first to make it work. Much like how the Wright brothers were the first to sustain heavier than air flight after multiple attempts by people before them, or, or Hillary and Tenzing reaching the top of Everest after attempts by others, you get the idea. Jim Hall's first attempt at this whole ground effect thing started as early as 1961. His car, of which there are no pictures it seems, had all the bits and pieces required to create ground effect, but the whole thing was way too unstable. So back to the drawing board. By 1966, two years before Chapman, he was adding aerofoils to his cars to produce downforce instead. And this is what people on TV will call top side aero. Air rushes over the front and rear wing, this pushes the car into the ground, generating more friction at the expense of drag, and increases cornering grip. You can do this yourself at home. Take your finger and run it lightly over the back of your hand and it's effortless. Push it in, and there's a bit more resistance there. But Hall came back in 1970 with the Chaparral, Chaparral, Chaparral 2J, which is sort of the precursor to Brabham's infamous fan car. This used a couple of fans at the back of the car and a skirt around the bottom of the car to basically create a vacuum that kept the car on track. It would produce about 1.5 G of downforce and was about 2 seconds a lap faster than the next fastest car. The SCCA banned it due to complaints from McLaren and other teams saying it would be too dominant, despite McLaren already dominating Can-Am and the other teams claiming that there was debris being shot out the back of it. But over in Europe in about 1968 or so, Tony Rudd and Peter Wright, who were two engineers at BRM, had experimented with using certain shaped body designs to clean up turbulent air. But the project didn't go too far as they both left the team. Wright went to March and suggested to Robin Hurd that they try what they were doing at BRM on the 701, which can be seen here. Because Formula 1 engineers hadn't worked out how to properly seal everything off, aero-wise that is, the amount of downforce produced by these aerofoil-shaped side pods wasn't enough to do any difference to performance. But at least it was a start. Meanwhile, Colin Chapman was paying a professor at the University of California to investigate underside aerodynamics, first used by Hall in about 1960-1961 or so as a feasible possibility on a Formula 1 car. Chapman had been looking at the de Havilland Mosquito fighter bomber and read how the way that the engines, the radiators and the overall design of the aircraft were there to induce lift, so wanted to find a way of reversing that for use on a Formula 1 car and through the research they came up with the basis of how these ground effect cars are designed in Formula 1, IndyCar, Group C, basically anywhere where underside downforce is needed. And here's how it works. Underneath these cars are these massive tunnels. They don't look like much, but they exploit something called the Bernoulli Principle to produce that sweet, sweet downforce that will keep the cars on the track. Now Bernoulli's principle basically says that as there is an increase in the speed of a fluid, or in this case air, there is a decrease in static pressure and this principle is derived in part from Newton's second law of motion. There's an equation for it, but it blows my brain, and this is from a guy who did an entire module on acoustics at university. Seriously, get the master handbook of acoustics if you really want to cook your brain. So using Bernoulli's principle, the air rushes into these tunnels, called Venturi tunnels, and because it's being rammed through there, it speeds up, therefore decreasing the pressure. That decrease in pressure sucks the car to the ground and generates underside downforce, way more than what standard front and rear wings could produce at that particular point in time. So this research, along with Rudd and Wright who had since moved to Lotus, combined to create the Lotus 78, the first of these ground effect cars. During the design process, Rudd and Wright noticed that the downforce did increase in line with the car's speed, even with the scale models on the rolling road they had. They then added a couple of strips of cardboard to the bottom of the car, creating a skirt, and noticed that the downforce increased even further as everything was sealed off much like those suckers holding up that soap dish in your bathroom. Now initially they were using brushes for these skirts which leaked air, 
They thought that solid nylon or rubber skirts would be banned, but Lotus recalled a couple of teams using rubber skirts to divert air away from the floor. So they went, well, they did it, so we can. The 78 was introduced for the first round of 1977. It was supposed to be entered earlier, but Chapman didn't want anyone to know what they were up to. And the car was successful, winning five races. Teams didn't know what this thing was or how it worked, and Lotus didn't know how it worked either, really. The whole thing was just a happy little accident. They even worked the radiators in such a way that hot air passing over the rear wing created downforce at all speeds, pretty much. I mean, I say it worked. There were a couple of things wrong with it. First is that they needed a massive rear wing because the Venturi tunnels weren't long enough to get all the cars sucked down, so at high speed circuits they had a bit of a speed deficit to other cars, and they had to extract more power from the DFV as a result, but that made it liable to blow up. The other problem was that the rear suspension was in the way of those hot radiator gases and that disturbed the airflow, making it want to slide. But it was a typical Lotus at this point. When it worked it was unstoppable, but it broke down too often to make the most of things. Andretti won more races than Lauda that year, but lost the championship as a result. When Andretti went fastest at Zolder, Chapman was reportedly furious with the Americans, saying that he'd gone too fast and revealed that Lotus had come up with something mega. Lotus came back in 1978 with the Lotus 79, and they had largely fixed the instability issues at the rear. The Venturi tunnels were made longer to balance the sucking across the car, and the downforce levels were 30% higher than what had come before on the 78. But there were issues here too. Because F1 cars were still relying on aluminium in their construction, and carbon fibre wasn't being used yet, the car was nowhere near rigid enough to handle the extra Gs, and it caused some concern. On top of this, because Peterson and Andretti were able to brake so late, there were concerns of brakes overheating. Brabham, meanwhile, had been working on the fan car, which borrowed from Jim Hall's 1970 Can-Am car, and it destroyed the 279s at the Swedish Grand Prix. And even though the fan car was within the rules, Bernie Eccleston withdrew it to win favour with the Formula 1 Constructors Association, the union of garage easters that he was the head of. Lotus won the 1978 titles, but it came at the expense of Peterson, who would be killed at the Italian Grand Prix. Which is a story for another day. But by 1979, the ground effect revolution had started. Other teams started debuting these cars with huge tunnels on the undersides to try and do what Lotus was doing and close the gap. And in 1979, Ferrari would take the Drivers' Championship, with Jody Schechter and the 312 T4 being part of that season. After being dominant in 1978 with the 79, Lotus dropped to fourth in 1979 as Ferrari, Williams and Ligier all seemed to ground effect better than they could. Well, looking at the results, it seems that Ferrari, Williams and Ligier just built more reliable cars. Part of this was because Lotus had tried with the Lotus 80, but the car was a total failure and they had to revert to the 79 that had since been surpassed by everybody else. Part of the reason the 80 failed is that it produced too much downforce, and that caused the phenomenon that is porpoising. Ah yes, the old backbreaker that is porpoising. In basic terms, it would go thusly. The car is driving around and the Venturi tunnels are doing their thing. Those Venturi tunnels have an inlet, a flat section, and then the exit. But if the centre of pressure is in front of the flat section, the nose drops and then the airflow is cut off. That then makes the nose rise again. Repeat that, no, oh, I don't know, about a few times a second, something like that, and the thing starts bouncing around. So the team started looking at ways of combating it. Ligier designed springs that had a £4,000 per foot rating or something, so they were super stiff, while Williams trialled running no suspension at all to maintain the stable ride height. Mark Sura said in an interview that in some cases they had to lift on straights because the rear wings on these cars were producing so much downforce, the front of the car wanted to lift up. Some teams, such as Arrows, didn't put front wings on the cars, and the underside of the car was doing all the downforce in its place. So it was basically doing that Escudo Pikes Peak thing from Gran Turismo 3. But the FIA was looking at things with a very careful eye. The speeds of these F1 cars had accelerated to borderline dangerous levels, and were only getting faster. The G-forces were too much for the cars to handle, and the teams were trying these workarounds to keep the cars on track and basically just winging their way through things, no pun intended. They'd already had a driver killed in 1978, and there was likely to be another, as G-forces were rumoured to be in the 4G range going through these corners. So by the end of 1980, the FIA said no more to the side skirts and mandated the 6cm or 2.5 inch ride height minimum, which would reduce the cornering speeds and also give the circuits time to catch up in terms of safety. But because onboard sensors didn't exist at this time, Gordon Murray at Brabham and Martin Ogilvie at Lotus decided to come up with their own solutions. 
Brabham went for the hydro suspension seen on the Citroen DS so that the car could get super low to the ground on track, but be totally legal when stood still. Lotus tried the twin chassis concept that we've already looked at in a previous video. As it so happens, Brabham and PK won the title that year, and the teams were left baffled as to how Murray had pulled this off and tried to protest it, not actually knowing what it was they were protesting. So they tried to copy it, not knowing what they were copying. Murray's system was all done hydraulically. On inlaps, the car slowly raised up again as there wasn't much downforce being applied, all done using aero and physics and science. The other teams just had a knob in the car that lowered the ride height on demand on track, and the FIA just let them get away with it because they had no way of policing it. And because they couldn't police it, the FIA dropped that 6 centimeter rule for 1982, and the cars were lower and stiffer than anything that had ever been before, and the drivers were being battered. To the point they started saying to their teams, look, enough is enough, we can't keep this up much longer. PK collapsed on the podium in Brazil because he was too exhausted. It also didn't help that there was no power steering, and having been pointed in this direction by Classic and SportsCar.com, the pole time of the 1982 Brazilian Grand Prix was 6 seconds faster than in 1981. And with the deaths of Gilles Villeneuve, Ricardo Paletti and also the career ending crash of Didier Peroni, the FIA finally had enough and outlawed ground effect entirely. Cars from then on were required to be flat bottomed, which resulted in F1 cars being run as low as humanly possible to extract anything they could get, and then that would be changed after the events of Imola 1994. But with the banning of ground effect, the FIA was faced with its next challenge. 1200 horsepower hand grenades, anyone? So then, a look at how ground effect came to be in Formula 1. If you've learned something here today, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on future stuff. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out with the image buying or just keep things running around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, my F1 affiliate link, and also my socials. Well, there's super thanks if you just want to do a one-off tip. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.